Stephen Cutler, thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. It's good to be with you. Yeah, was, uh, I've got a ton of questions around flow, around your new book that came out recently, uh, all the books that you've written, of course, with Peter Diamandis. Uh, it, you, you, you've got a ton of different topics that I, I see you've written about, that you've talked about, that you've researched about. So I'm excited to dig in. But first, I read that you have set up a dog sanctuary where you're living with 25 dogs. This is a while back. So I don't know if this is something that you're still doing. So if so, is this some, still some, something that is the case? And how did you get into this? So uh, it isn't, it isn't still the case. Um, so we, what we, my wife and I uh, had, I, we got into this because I'm an animal geek. Uh, I'm a site, you know, I, I'm, I'm a long, since I was a little kid when I, uh, came up in, uh, when I was coming up as a journalist, even as a, you know, in the early days I was doing a lot of science writing, but most of it was neuroscience and psychology because I wanted to understand how humans ticked. But the other half of it was, I was like trying to hang out with scientists who were hanging out with animals and mm. I'm, you know, and I, would, and you know, this I would go really far out of my way. I'd work for like two years to like get myself a plane ticket and an invitation to Madagascar to go study with Patricia Wright, who was hanging out with lemurs uh, in Madagascar. And, you know, I would I would so I, I was going really far out of my way to work around animals. And I've always been very involved in environmental causes and protecting biodiversity. These are passions of mine and have been for a very long time. And um, when I met my wife and she was doing dog rescue, uh, it was just an opportunity to like do more of this and, and, and spend more time around animals. I didn't also have any idea what I was asking for, but what we were doing and why it's different is we were living in Chimayo, New Mexico, uh, and we were operating a hospice and special needs dog sanctuary and dog rescue. Chimayo, New Mexico is the second poorest county in America with one of the highest instances of animal cruelty. So we were, we were working on the front lines and we operate and we did that for, um, about 13 years. And, um, you can only sort of work on the front lines for so long, uh, before you really start to burn out. So, uh, we, uh, we still do the sanctuary work. Um, we're not doing it. We don't do the rescue work anymore. We moved, we still do the sanctuary work and we're, like quietly basically taking a year, year and a half off um, before we relaunch a couple of our bigger national programs. It was, um, you can work, we worked on the front lines for a very long time. We, uh, we've never been on a honeymoon, never been on taking a vacation because of the dogs. And we helped about 562 dogs pass through our facility. We helped another 5,000 through our outreach program. And that sounds sort of heroic and huge. And then you realize they euthanize 8 million dogs a year and you realize, holy crap, I didn't even dent October and it took a decade. So we pulled back and said, okay, there's got to be something we could right, we can do at a bigger level because um, we were, you know, we traded everything for those animals and um, it was, it was cool and it was very effective and I'm glad we did it. But, uh, you know, we want to figure out how to do the same thing, but bigger. And what does working on the front lines exactly mean? Like what is required on your end well, to be working? So, I mean, what that actually, when you're living in a, it, it means, first of all, you're always at capacity, right? You're all at rescuers in general. There's no real government money for, for animal work. Um, it goes to the SPCA, which is essentially a euthanasia program. Um, so until there's national spay and neuter laws, um, and national uh, laws that uh, that cover breeding and what's allowed and what's not allowed. Um, there's just going to be too many animals, and um, so ours our job was a lot harder because um, we were living in you know we were living on the front lines and living in that community. So living in a very poor rural low income community and trying to you know we would van around from people's homes like people would get dogs and you know we would go into the community and try and spave and neuter people's dogs we would try to help people's dogs and you know in the end um it was we were mostly just maxed out because there's yeah. only you know what i mean like ultimately 
people were losing their animals and giving up their animals and you're going up against things like cultural change and, and bigger issues than um you know a husband and wife team could really go after and um it was it was an interesting lesson yeah i mean i've just i've never heard of anyone that is doing this and still able to perform at the level that you do with all of these books that you've got coming out and that have came out and the company that you run, you know, and what you're trying to, to accomplish, how do you get anything done with 25 dogs running around and you're trying to write a book and trying to get in flow? And I mean, talk to, talk to me a little bit about what that is like and still well, trying to one, be productive. So dogs, the pack is a lot quieter than most assume. Um, we do a bunch of things very, very differently. A lot of our, our, our work is based on a lot of evolutionary psychology, a lot of flow psychology. So our dogs, I mean, they're still dogs, but they're a lot calmer than, than most people would assume because of the way they're cared for. They're really happy. They're really mellow. They live together as a big pack. Um, and so it's, uh, it's a little more peaceful than you would assume. Uh, my wife is an astounding woman an astounding woman who does tremendous amounts of the heavy lifting. So don't for, you know what I mean? Like my contribution <laughs> versus her contribution on the dog front. I mean, come on. So, uh, uh, that, that was, that's, that's part of it. And part of it is I wrote, you know, the new book is called the art of impossible. It is a book about the, how, what, what science tells us about peak performance and about the fact that, you know, there's a system and there's a way these things work. And if you get them working correctly, you get so much farther, faster. And there's nothing, I mean, not, not that this is proof of anything, but there's nothing in that book that I don't apply on a daily basis and have for a very long time. Can you think of something that you've applied in the book that has really made a big impact in your life that maybe you didn't know before you wrote the book that you realize now? That's uh, Sean. That the book is based on thirty years of research. It's every single thing I've ever learned about the neurobiology of peak human performance put together into a system. So, like you, you're, at, at, you're at, yes is the answer. Yeah. You know, I, you know, I need you to be a little more specific, or I'm just going to pick up one random thing. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it, it could be it could be a random thing, maybe just something that you can recall that's made the biggest impact. I there, there is no biggest impact um as far as I can tell. I will say this is not going to make a whole lot of sense until we spend a little bit of time talking more about flow. Yes. But here's the thing I did that's it's very counterintuitive and I'll I'll, I'll talk about I'll talk so everybody's got what's called flow is a state of optimal performance, right? It's any of those peak states where you get so focused on the task at hand that everything else just seems to disappear. Action awareness will start to merge. Your sense of self will get really quiet. Time will pass strangely. Usually it speeds up and five hours go by in like five seconds. Sometimes it'll slow down. You get a freeze frame effect, meaning you're a car crash. And throughout all aspects of performance, both mental and physical, go through the roof. Okay, flow definition out of the way. We know what we're talking about. Most people have what is called a primary flow activity. This is essentially that thing that you've done throughout the course of your life that really you just dropped you right into the zone. Maybe it was something you were doing in, as a kid, horseback riding, yoga, skiing, surfing, riding, playing model airplanes, you know, dancing to hip hop, playing the market, whatever it was that just has lit you up throughout your life and just drops you in, meaning like 90%, 80%, 90% of the time you go do it, just drops you into flow. Now for me, it was skiing. As a general rule, what happens as we become adults is, oh, we put down childish things, we've got families, we've got hot lives and wives and things that matter and got jobs and got to focus on what's important and we forget our primary flow activity, it gets shelved. And what I redid, what I moved to the mountains and I moved there when I moved, uh, I was in Los Angeles and we moved to the mountains in New Mexico, northern New Mexico. And I was sitting literally at the dead center of five ski resorts. Chimayo is like 45 minutes from five of the best uh, ski resorts in, in northern New Mexico. 
and I committed to skiing twice a week, no matter what. Um, and skiing was my primary flow activity. And the reason this matters so much is this. There's three or four things about flow that are really important to understand. One, flow is essentially a focusing skill. In the same way that mindfulness and meditation and those things are talked about as focusing skills, there's different kinds of focus when you look at what's going on in the brain, somebody who's meditating versus somebody who's in flow. There's some crossover, but there are different things going on. But similarly, it's a focusing skill. And like any other skill, right, the, the more you practice it, the better you get. So the more flow you get, the more flow you get. So going skiing on Saturday or on Monday means way more flow at work Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Now, flow is a massive amplification in performance. We'll go through the numbers, but it's, it's just huge on motivation, creativity, grit, learning, productivity, performance whole bunch of stuff gets usually amplified. So you get farther faster by training up the brain to be in flow. That's the first thing. The second thing is that flow, as we move into the state for reasons, again, we can get into if you care, all the stress hormones are flushed out of your system. Sort of we reset the nervous system, it calms us down. Now anxiety, as everybody learned the hard way last year, is a massive blocker of performance, right? So by fleshing stress hormones out of your system, you're doing just a lot for performance. As a bonus, you also, the, the neurochemicals that underpin flow massively amplify you know, a lot of things, including the immune system. So the neurochemicals boost the immune system. So you're calming down, your immune system is getting boosted a little bit, you're training flow up, and this is not my work uh, exactly, but we know flow produces a massive increase in creativity, creative problem solving, all aspects of, of, of creative problem solving. And uh, depending on whose numbers you look at, we've done some of this work, some has been done at the University of Sydney, some at Harvard, a couple other places. Flow will amplify creativity 400 to 700%, and that's all aspects like problem identification, pattern recognition, on and on and on, everything you break that down into. But uh, some work that came out of Harvard by Teresa Amable, found that that heightened creativity, that heightened innovation, that heightened problem solving will outlast the flow state by a day, maybe two. Now, here in the 21st century, creativity has been called the most important skill for thriving, right? It's, it, it's the number one skill CEOs need to lead companies. It's the number one skills our kids need most to thrive. It's on and on and on. Employees, um, creative employees outperform, out earn, out are happier blah, by huge margins, 10, 15, 20 percent, depending on whose numbers you're looking at. So that heightened creativity you get in flow will outlast the flow state by a day, maybe two. So by going skiing, you know, on Monday and taking three hours off from work, it sounds like a luxury, but it's actually really core to this work. And we train people now at the Flow Research Collective in this stuff and doubling down your primary flow activity, at least trying to get like one afternoon a week in. Um, you can split that up, but like that amount of time in has such magnificent performance benefits all over. That was something that I started doing where I sort of, I knew the science and I didn't believe it was gonna work. You know what I mean? I, yep. I, and now yep. I saw it work in my own life and I've seen it work in so many people's lives that I no longer, you know, one of the good things about our company is we train about a thousand people a month. So um, besides starting with the neurobiology on the front end and working with like, you know, labs at Stanford and USC and Imperial College, which are all the places we work with to do the science, we then can battle test it with a thousand people a month. So sure. We have really great data sets on peak performance. So we've seen this primary flow activity really work in people's lives. But I will say at the time, it's just, and you know, it's the problem with that kind of stuff is, is one, it only works if you don't feel guilty about it. If you're feeling guilty about taking the time off, right, you have to literally make that sort of the most important thing you do because flow is the most important thing we can do for our productivity. And there are companies that do this, Patagonia, same kind of rule with their let my people go surfing policy where employees can go surfing out front of the corporate headquarters whenever the waves are breaking. It's the same idea. They're doing, you know, Yvonne Chouinard was a big surfer and he's doing the same thing I was doing in, in a sense. Um, and it's deadly effective, but it's very counterintuitive. And if you're at all wired like me, you're a go-getter, you don't like to stop, you don't like to rest, you don't like to not work. Um, 
that feels really indulgent. It took a while to get over that. And you also like, you got to have some conversations if you're going to, with your bosses, with your wives, with your, for, you know what I mean? Because they feel the same way. And you got to have those conversations ahead of time. Now we train people to do that kind of stuff and it makes sense. But sort of learning it along the way, some of it gets tricky. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, without understanding the science of how you get into flow more, or people don't even really understand what flow truly is, it might be a bit hard to convince someone that taking a luxury ski trip is actually a good way to be more productive in the long run. But it's interesting what you said about the fact that it is kind of like a I didn't a month. say luxury, by the way. I just said go skiing. All right. I, like True. I live 45 minutes from the mountain and I would drive my, you know, beater truck up there and, and yeah. you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, luxury as in like the luxury of free time. I didn't mean, you know, yeah, living the fancy luxury, life, time luxury. Time luxury you know, right? one of the things that's really key, this is key overall in peak performance, it's true with flow, it's true with all of human peak performance. There are a number of areas where you have to go slow to go fast. Where you have to do, you know, there are things, there are places where your emotions don't exactly mean what you think they mean. There are places where slow, you know, flow is a, McKinsey did a survey, right? They mm -hmm. talked to top executives and it's self-reported, so grain of salt, but talk to a lot of them, how more product, how much more productive do you feel in flow than out of flow? And after a decade of talking to executives, the average was 500% more productive. That's a massive, massive uptick in productivity. It means you go to work on Monday, make Monday in a flow state, take Tuesday through Friday off, and you've gotten as much done as everybody else. Mm -hmm. That's literally that big of an uptick. It's Two days a week in flow, you're about a thousand percent more productive than the competition. So you, you, yes, you're taking some time off, but if you actually drop into flow more frequently during the rest of the week, as a result, there, there's no, you know, there, it's it's not even a trade off. You get so much time back, but you have to have your conversations on the front end. That's for sure. Yeah, and just to reiterate, the reason for that is because when you're in flow, whether it's skiing or whether it's work, that flow that you get into from skiing can actually translate into and transfer into helping you get into flow through other means, maybe something that is around work much faster. Oh, yeah, because you're just training the brain to focus in a particular way. The yeah. creativity that shows up in flow um, is going to outlast the flow state. And more importantly, this is more complicated. We'd have to get into what, where flow comes from, but anxiety blocks flow. So you, for too much norepinephrine and cortisol in the system will block flow. A little bit is good, but too much is, will really block it. So flow skiing on Monday where you reset your nervous system and calm down, if you go to work on Tuesday and you're calmer, A, you've been training up the focusing skill, B, you're in a better state for producing the state. The heightened creativity is going to carry over, etc. cetera. Mm, gotcha, gotcha. And I think we should go into a bit of the neuroscience behind what is happening behind our, uh, you know, in our bodies and our brains when we are achieving flow. I think people know that it's an increase of endorphins and, and dopamine and, and serotonin. I think there's five factors that you mentioned in, in, uh, when you were teaching the state of flow. Uh, but I think a lot of people think that there is more activity in the brain as well. And I think there was a study on John Hopkins where they actually realized when they were studying jazz musicians, I think it was, it was in one of the articles that you wrote, uh, where they were, we did an F MRI and it is actually the opposite where they shut off the so, prefrontal cortex. Yeah. Please go on. When you're talking about the neurobiology, you're talking about four things. You're talking about neuroelectricity and, and neurochemistry which are the way the brain communicates with itself and with the body. Either it sends chemical messages or electrical messages or both. And then you're talking about neural anatomy, where in the brain something's taking place, and networks, because things rarely take place in one spot. What you were talking about is an idea that was uh, first proposed by the very brilliant Arne Dietrich and then validated first by Charles Lim and then by Alan Braun, both at Johns Hopkins. And it, our older idea about peak performance and the older meaning turn of the century, like 19th century, was uh, what sometimes these days called the 10 percent brain myth. You've heard this. This is the idea that, hey, you're only using a small chunk of your brain. So peak performance must be the full brain and overdrive. 
right? And what they discovered is, at least as far as the neural atomical portion is concerned, we sort of had it backwards. In flow, we're not using more of the brain, we're using less of the brain. And one way to think about this at a really basic level is um, it's an efficiency exchange. Your brain is 2% of your mass and uses 25% of your energy at rest. At when it's doing work, it's way more. So it is, it is the largest basic drain on your caloric input that you've got, right? It's your energy mm -hmm. and it's your energy and it's draining um, when it does work. So anything the brain can do for more efficiency is a big deal. And when we are moving into flow, the brain needs a ton of extra energy for focus. You've gotta to be totally focused on the task at hand. The brain is trying to do that. It shuts down non-critical structures, things that are not needed to totally keep your attention on the task at hand. And a large portion of that is the prefrontal cortex gets turned off. So. Um, people talk about why does self get so quiet? Why does my sense of self disappear and flow? Or why does time pass strangely, right? Time is a great one. And time passes strangely and flow for a number of different reasons. But one of the most obvious is that time is a sort of a network effect. It's a bunch of different structures in the prefrontal cortex, part of your brain that's right behind your forehead, talking to each other and sort of calculating how, how what's going on now, what's coming, all that stuff. And when we drop into flow and these structures start to shut down, we lose our ability to separate past from present from future. And we're plunged into what researchers talk about as the deep now, the elongated present. This is why five hours go by in like five minutes or sometimes time slows down or whatever. And it's worth also pointing out that this has a huge impact on performance for really obvious reasons once you sort of get it, which is that most, I talked about how anxiety blocks performance, most of the stuff that scares us. See, there's scary stuff that happened in the past that we're trying to avoid in the present, or it's scary stuff that could maybe might happen in the future, right? Unless you're an actual, you know, in combat or an action sport athlete or a couple other things, very rarely is the right here, right now a huge crisis. So if we remove past and future, this is one of the reasons stress hormones are flushed out of your system and flow. Right at this point, uh, as I remove past and future, you calm down a lot. So this is one of this is one of the ways that flow impacts performance is is this kind of mechanism. But that's called transient hypofrontality. And yes, there are um, there are five major pleasure chemicals, neurochemicals that are associated with flow. There's way more that are involved in flow, right? Like that list doesn't include. Um, things like glutamate, which is the main, you know, neurotransmitter in the brain or GABA, which is an, another one of the main. So, but there are five big dopamine, serotonin, nandamide, endorphins, and um, norepinephrine, norepinephrine all seem to show up in flow. And, you know, when you're talking about flow's huge impact on performance, for example, take a, take your pick. It's always these neural chemicals, right? Why is flow such a huge impact on motivation? We're talking about what McKinsey discovered, right? Well, these are five of the most potent pleasure chemicals the brain can produce. And just like to put them in context, so when we talk about endorphins, those are natural opiates, right? They're the brain's internal version of Oxycontin or morphine or heroin, those drugs. And just to give you an idea, there's about 20 different endorphins in the brain. The most common one is 100, more, 100 times more potent than medical morphine. So when we talk about these as reward chemicals, you're talking about really, really powerful, powerful pleasure drugs, mm. right? And the brain cocktails them. You would, if you tried to cocktail the street drug version of dopamine and serotonin, by the way, you would fail. You couldn't, the brain can't do it. When you try to, when you try to do with street drugs, one will swamp the other always. Um, with, but the brain, so the brain can cocktail stuff better than we could on the street in ways we can't. The drugs are very, very powerful. And that's so the technical term for this is flow is autotelic. Autotelic means an end in itself. It means when an experience starts producing flow, it's so fun, so pleasurable, so ecstatic, so joyous. We're gonna go really far about our way to get more of it. Fancy way of saying flow is the most addictive state on earth. Mm -hmm. It's also right when people rate what's my favorite experience on the planet, 
flow always tops the list and it you know it goes farther than that because we know that the people who score off the charts for overall well-being for life satisfaction for meaning purpose these are always the people with most flow in their lives psychologists define three levels of happiness available all humans on the planet and the amount of flow you get are directly related to level two and three the second and the third the highest most exalted happiness and the right below it the amount of flow that you're getting in your life is a major contributor to that so this is foundational human motivation being used for our benefit. So tapping into it this way, you know, tapping into these neurochemicals and these powerful biological processes um, is you, just hugely effective as a performance technique. Yeah, no, it's a very interesting way you put it. I mean, we're always looking for, it seems, external drugs or external things that can increase our dopamine, serotonin, to get that level of activity in our brains to make us happier, to find us, find enlightenment, whatever it might be. But what you're talking about is that we can intrinsically, internally produce these uh, dopamine levels and these positive, addictive uh, chemicals in our brains by just being able to gear certain activities or focus uh, in the things that we do. It's very interesting way to, to look at it, given how big of a drug problem that we have, you know, in, yeah, in the so US. I, I, yeah, I, it's, it's worth talking about this for a second. So th there's two things that, this, that you sort of hit on. One is, is very true. At the Flow Research Collective, um, we focus on psychological and physiological interventions, and they're not sexy. They're so not sexy. I like to tell people that nothing I can teach you about peak human performance is gonna get like, you laid when you talk about hmm. it in the bar on Friday night just isn't. Um, and let me stop for pause for one second and say, when we're talking about peak performance, we are talking about nothing more, nothing less than getting our biology to work for us rather than against us. That's all we're talking about. There's nothing else going on. There's no secret secret. And as you mentioned, we don't use technologies and we don't use substances. And so if I was being dramatic, if I'm on stage and I really want to make this point, I, I make it this way, which is, Back when I was a journalist, on five separate occasions I was shot at. At no point when I, somebody was shooting at me could I say, excuse me, sir, would you mind putting down that AR-15 while I take this substance and drop my brain into alpha state and produce a bunch of dopamine so I can dodge your bullets? Doesn't really work that way, right? Or let me put it more prosaically, but in a situation we've all been in, when your boss says, yo, Sean, get in here. I need that presentation. You're going to do it like next Monday. I need it now. And you got to do it for my boss and her boss and her boss and the fate of the world and your job depends upon it. Or even more prosaically, hey, honey, can you come in here? I need to talk to you for a minute. Like when hey, honey shows up, you are oh, hold on, dear. Let me microdose or let me use this technology to and drain my brain like. The world doesn't work that way. You want stuff that is reliable, repeatable, works for everybody, works at scale, right? No matter what. And that's why we rely on the psychological tools, but they're not sexy. And one of the biggest problems that people have in learning this stuff is they want the whiz bang, right? They want the whiz bang and they want a biohack. There are no hacks, there are no shortcuts. There's just our biology. It either works for you, or it works against you. There's, it, it, there's no secret secret. It's not sexy. Are, you know what I mean? Like it's like the primary flow activity, right? That's like maybe it'll feel good or whatever, but it, like that's a huge performance idea. That's an enormous performance tool, right? Is it super sexy? Is it like, oh, I'm microdosing. Oh no, I'm doubling down on my primary flow activity. You know <laughs> yeah. what I mean? Like it's not cool. Um, but you know, as a, as basically what was somebody pointed out, I said, I said this, you know, you won't get nothing I, I talk about will get you laid on a Friday night. And somebody, I did this recently. I, it was one of those interactive podcasts where they were as live audience and somebody typed back, they were like, yeah, but success gets you laid. <laughs> okay. <laughs> fair enough. So the end That's result true. of applying this stuff, but you know, yeah, yeah, no doubt. Now, because of the uh, the positive effects that it has on the brain and probably happiness, has there been any studies or research done 
around trying to find repeatable ways to use flow to cure depression, to help people with maybe addiction problems that are trying to find external things to increase that level of dopamine and serotonin in their in their brains. Good question, Sean. So I let's let's I try to I stay in my lane. Mm-hmm. My lane, I, my my work is taking people from normal up to Superman. That's the work we do, sure. right? That's what we're doing. Broken to normal, that is almost all of the rest is psychology, and there are wonderful, brilliant experts doing that work. And we do, there is overlap, so we do some of that. Here's what I can tell you. Uh, I wrote about this in both Stealing Fire and Rise of Superman. There's been significant work done uh, at Camp Pendleton, for example, uh, with soldiers and PT, with PTSD. And using flow, not uh, with talk therapy, they were using surfing actually as a, as a flow trigger because it's packed with flow triggers. It's a good way to drop people into flow plus sure. talk therapy. Um, that's been going on. And uh, a lot of people have, that program's all been around for a while. A bunch of other people have been doing it. We work uh, with some programs that are trying the same thing with disabled veterans, mm-hmm. um, disabled athletes. Um, playing in those spaces a little bit. And we are working with uh, some of the scientists who are doing the actual trauma work, flow trauma work, trying to lend our flow knowledge to their work, but it's not directly what we do. There are other, there's a number of treatment, uh, drug addiction treatment centers that are using flow and outdoor uh, activities, mostly adventure sport activities kind of thing. Um, Camping, wilderness, survival, that sort of thing. for uh, treating addiction. I have not, I can tell you the neurobiology of why flow should be useful in the treatment of addiction. And I can tell you that it makes sense, but I can also tell you that I have not seen enough data Mm. on it yet. And I, rule one for Steven is like, it's hard enough for everybody here. You know what I mean? Don't make things worse. Mm. So, I, I'm sort of a science nut. I want overwhelming amounts of support before I talk about stuff out loud. I want really overwhelming amount of support before I'm willing to risk it in like even training our clients, let alone people who are starting really broken. I'm really cautious. And again, not my expertise. I, I now, and even in, you know, most of the, if you take our training, for example, zero to dangerous, which is the flow research collectives, main flow training, um, you go through it with a PhD psychologist or neuroscientist as a coach. Um, and they, you know, even like, you know, if, if you come in really broken, we will tell you to go get help, right? That's not the work we do where well, we can help you identify it and say, Hey, this is going to stand in your way of doing this work, but it's really not the work we do. So I'm cautious about how much I speak to it. Cause I don't have, you know what I mean? Yeah. Crazy. No, no, I t- Totally, totally understand. I mean, I, I would imagine that there is something there uh, that if if someone was to dig into it and, and do enough research, the oh, there's a, there's there appears to be a lot of there there. But you got I, I should tell you how ironic this is. So, <laughs> transient hypofrontality, which you talked about the Johns Hopkins experiment, and I said it was R and Dietrich's idea. When Dietrich first proposed it, everybody thought he was crazy. And the reason they thought he was crazy was the first place we saw hypofrontality was Nora Bokov's work. She ran NIDA, the National Institute for Drug Abuse, and they started to notice that in addicts, huge swatches of the prefrontal cortex are shut down. Executive regulation lives there, right? Your ability to resist temptation and things like that also live there. Um, so it took a while. We thought it was this, we thought this was a bad thing, not a good thing or a neutral thing. It was sometimes useful and sometimes horrible, yeah. but that's one of the reasons that was so controversial and took so long to figure out because we were looking at it and we were like, well, this is a drug addict thing. This is bad. This can't be good. So it was really counterintuitive. Sure, yeah. Now, at the Flow Research Collective, um, who are who are kind of like the, the examples of clients that come to your company to really uh, get into... It- it, we So we train about a 1,000 people a month, as I said, and it ranges from members of the U.S. Special Forces to Olympic and professional athletes to we train a ton of C-suite executives. Mm-hmm. I would say 60 to 70% of our business is either C-suite executives who um, either feel like they've, they've hit a limit and they can't go where they want to go or they've burned out 
and they, they need to reboot. Or uh, this another category of, of folks that we train a lot of, and I love this, is these pow- powerhouse women in their 40s and 50s, and they were powerhouses in their 20s, and they had a family, and they took a bunch of time off, and now they're like 40 or 50 years old, and they want to kick ass, mm-hmm. and they want to really level up. And so we train, a, uh, and I, those, those are some of my favorite clients. And, uh, you know, I, I like to say it goes from like the U.S. Special Forces to like insurance brokers from Indiana and soccer moms from Georgia. It, we really train everybody, but I want 60, 70% of our business falls into the executives who, you know, really want to take on, want to take their company, their organization to the next level, or have hit a wall of some kind. Um, or uh, just powerhouse amazing women who sort of want to reboot and and have a really amazing second or third act. Right, and and their reasoning for going through the training like this, you know, beyond high performance and maybe beyond increasing or decreasing anxiety and all that stuff. Is there other benefits that we can really? Well, you got to talk. Like- I mean, you got you got to talk about what. Fl- so, the training is based around. And this is sort of the core idea at the heart of Hard Impossible um, as well. You have to, one, talk about what does what flow amplify, right? So will you get, you'll get more motivation, grit, and productivity. Learning rates will accelerate. Creativity, innovation, problem solving, get better collaboration, cooperation. Um, all those skills go up as well. Um, we also... You also have to train people up in the same skills that flow amplifies because you don't want to chink in your game. Flow is a turbo boost, right? And it so motivation is a series of skills, learning is a series of skills, creativity is a series of skills. Those are the big categories of what get amplified in flow. But if you haven't, if those skills aren't in place, it's like a car, right? You can have a Model T, it's a cool car, skinny bicycle tires, and it's designed, you can kick ass at 25 miles an hour. But if I turbo boost the car and suddenly it's going 100 miles an hour, those skinny ass tires are a liability and you're gonna crash the car. Mm. So if I amplify the system massively with flow, this is something, you asked some of the things that's in the new book that wasn't in some of the older stuff, and this is one of those big ideas, um, which is, We found using the neurobiology of how flow works and the flow triggers that flow is actually remarkably easy to train. And this is new information. It was not, if you go back to like the 90s, when psychologists were trying to train flow, we were bad at it. We were just Mm. across the board, the the field um, and uh, was, was just bad at it. And the reason in all honesty is that psychology is metaphor. It's wonderful field. It's amazing, but it's a, it's mostly metaphor. Neurobiology is mechanism. If you get things down to the mechanism level, it's reliable and repeatable, and it works for everybody, kind of thing. And that's what's happened. And once you get flow down to mechanism, we found we're using the exact same psychometric instruments they were using in the '90s um, to test flow now, and we're seeing a 70 to 80 percent increase in flow on the back end of our training, almost across the boards. The issue, what used to happen is no longer happening, thank God, is um, we used to get this boost and then there'd be this horrific return to baseline. Like you'd get huge increases in the flow for two, three months and then like just fall off this cliff. And, Hmm. you know, first of all, when you turn on the flow juice in your clients and suddenly it turns off, you have very, very, very angry clients. Why was it turning off? turning off for this very reason you have to train up all the skills that are being amplified and flow so let me give you uh, a couple of examples but here's a really simple one that's easy for people to grasp so we got to start with the idea that flow states have triggers preconditions that lead to more flow so you want more flow in your life these things are your toolkit and you want to talk about unsexy things that aren't going to sound like they move the needle like they move Um, The most important of flow is triggers. What's often called the golden rule of flow is what's known as the challenge skills ratio. The idea here is really simple. Flow follows focus, right? So that's what all the triggers do. Neurobiologically, they drive attention in the present moment. We pay the most attention to the task at hand when the challenge of that task slightly exceeds our skill set. So you always want to be stretching, using your skills, sort of pushing them to the utmost, but you don't want to snap. Right, it's sort of like not the midpoint, but near the midpoint between boredom, not enough stimulation here, and anxiety, whoa, way too much. Right, in between is what's known as the flow channel. And 
it's this is just outside your comfort zone, right? Is mm -hmm. essentially where you're stretching towards. So that's what I mean. For meeker, shyer, less type A types, it's tricky because you got to get comfortable being more uncomfortable. But if you're our charging type, you will you will take on challenges that are so much bigger than the sweet spot, simply sort of for the thrill of it. And I'm not saying don't go after those high hard goals, but you got to chunk it down so what you're it's right in front of you sits in that sweet spot. So all that is backstory. When you're in that sweet spot all the time, you're learning, right? You're using your skills to the utmost. But if you don't have, for example, if you don't have a growth mindset, you haven't trained up your, to have a growth mindset, you're literally blocking learning. If you don't know how to learn knowledge acquisition or skills acquisition, or you don't have truth filters is a really good one. Truth filters are ways to evaluate the stuff you're learning very quickly, right? This could be the scientific method. I was taught like the fact checking rules of investigative journalism. Uh, Elon Musk talks a lot about first principle thinking, right? These are all truth filters. There's ways of quickly validating or invalidating the stuff you're learning. So there's a, a learning is a skill, a, a series of skills. If you can't do this, you can't, it doesn't matter that flow, when I say flow amplifies learning, what I mean is how does learning and memory work in the brain? When you talk about flows, 240 to 500% boost in, in learning, the more neurochemicals that show up during experience, the better chance that experience will move from short-term holding into long-term storage, mm -hmm. right? That's how the process works. Neurochemicals do a lot of things. One of the things they do is tag experiences, important to save for later. Flows this big neurochemical dump, as we talked about earlier, so you get massively amplified learning. But if you can't separate fact from fiction, and suddenly you're learning shit that is not true, now you've got real problems. So what was happening was, or motivation skills, or grit skills, or creative, like, we can, tr we can amplify these very things, but if you haven't layered in the basics, you start to have real problems and you know different we've started to realize that different categories of people tend to have different weaknesses for example uh if you deal with uh both the u.s special forces or uh type a executives for example they tend to have terrible sleep habits and recovery habits and so because it goes along with their profession right so um those are chinks in certain kind, you know, in your armor along the way, there's penalties for those things. So oh. we started to realize it, less about the flow stuff and more about all the whole sequence of human peak performance and the biology, you know, there's, when you talk about it, the biology is designed to be used in a system, in a sequence, in a very particular way to get the most out of it. And that was what we weren't doing then and we're now doing now. And we don't have these problems, thank God, but we were for a while. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think you're totally right. I was really trying to figure out what is the repeatable process of, of getting into flow. And whenever I'm doing something that is difficult or something that just requires complete focus or I risk perhaps even podcasting or learning a new skill, if I slightly distract and I know there's going to be consequences for it, those are times where I can repeatedly realize that I can get into some sort of flow. And it does require this positive loop of being able to constantly push yourself. So especially if you're like a type A player, you always have to learn new skills and to, and to push yourself into boundaries that you, maybe you haven't gone into because flow can be an addictive process in this case. So uh, yeah, so by the way, there is a dark side to this particular thing. Oh, yes, just go in. This work done in Germany where they found that your risk tolerances continuously increase over time. And risk tolerances are essentially genetically hardwired. They're really locked in at birth. And they're hard. You can change them. And we, we there's ways to can learn to confront fear. And some of it's really necessary for peak performance. Flow sort of does it automatically for you for this very reason. So, you know, you have to, there's certain, you have to guard against it a little bit. You have to know where you're going. I always say that this is not, the work I do is different than self-help. Self-help is like, can I get a 5% boost in my performance over the next three months, right? And that's great. And that's fantastic. But um, the work we do is a 500% boost, right? It's a big mm -hmm. difference. But self-help isn't going to break you. This stuff, if you get it wrong, 
you're playing with very powerful foundational neurobiological systems, right? It's, it has more consequences and it, you, you, you got to wear the big boy pants. Yeah. Big girl pants. Big girl pants know? as well. Yeah. But because you work with high performing athletes, people like that, or, you know, maybe rock climbers or, or, or surfers, I think you've worked with like some of the top performing athletes out there that could essentially die if they were to push themselves at a level that well that's you know, it yeah it's interesting because with the athletes with peak performers in general it's you want so from a motivation standpoint what are known as high hard goals mm -hmm. um you want to set them you get an 11 to 25 percent boost in performance boost in productivity boost in motivation simply by having high hard goals that's huge Right, like if an eight hour day is your baseline, that's like getting two free hours of work simply for having the right goals set around your day. You're crazy to not use that tool. But you also need clear goals, your daily to-do list, and those have to be, you know, uh, a while ago, a Google mathematician and Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, one of the godfathers of flow psychology, tried to put a number on the difference between challenge and skills, and it was a back of the envelope calculation, and their number was 4%. And um, meaning we maximize flow when the challenge is 4% greater than our skills. And that we've done a ton of research around that number. And it's very hard to study. So I don't think there's anything definitive, but let's just say it's a damn accurate metaphor, right? It's a damn accurate metaphor. And for top performers and top performing athletes, they often take on challenges that are so much bigger than that. And again, don't not do that, but today all like you got to remember that flow can only you can take on challenges that are four percent because flow can help you meet those challenges but it's designed to work in and around there it's not designed to help you take a quantum 25 percent leap in performance in a day it doesn't quite work that way sure. and so having athletes um go a little slower but steadier right it, it's this is really a case of slow and steady wins the race. I mean, you know, you also pointed out you're gonna have to be uncomfortable every single day of your life to do this work, right? Just a little outside your skill set, but it's just a little. Mm. And sooner or later, you start getting used to it and leaning into that challenge, and it gets really interesting. Sure, sure. Now, to, to kind of end off on this topic of flow, you know, obviously, because of the company that you run, are there some sort of a repeatable process that you take clients through and i only ask this because it's not one-on-one -on -one clients that you're always working with it sounds like you have thousands of clients that go through the training on a monthly basis uh have has there been like a repeatable process that we can share with people listening that can help them at least increase their chances of getting into flow more on a daily basis so And you give you three things. The answer is we talked about the primary flow activity. So start there. Two, um, I have a gift for your listeners, which is go to www.flowblocker.com. Mm -hmm. So there are six major blockers for flow, and we just built a diagnostic and we're just giving it away for free. And the best place you can start probably is double down your primary flow activity and then take the flow blocker diagnostic and make that course correct in your life. If you want to go farther than that, zero to dangerous.com is how you register for our training. And if you go there and sign up, you'll sign up for an interview with a coach that's it's free. They'll, they'll spend an hour on the phone with you. They can help you dial it up. If you want to read about this stuff, the new book is art of impossible. And literally there's a bunch of onboarding processes. But by the end of the book, everything we're talking about is about six daily processes and seven weekly processes. Weekly, one example would be your primary flow activity. That's one of the things you want to do. Most of the daily processes are really quick. They're like little quick, th quick and hitting things. Or there's stuff you're going to be doing anyways, and we're just going to alter sort of the way you're doing it a little bit. Um, so it is really applicable by anybody. But I can't. There's no three things I can distill it down into. There, there, anybody can get a hell of a lot better, but I don't, everybody's a little different. So you're probably doing some of this stuff and what exactly I should tell you to do. Um, 
uh, the best I can give you is the, the, the diagnostic, the flow blocker, the zero to dangers. You want to go further with that art of Impo- the art of impossible.com will give you everything in the book. Um, those are your best bets right now. Yeah. Is that, is that cause it's so individual? It's kind of like a personality test. Like it, you can't just give a one size fits all. No, I can formula. give a one, so, I, one, one size fits all, but there is no one thing. Mm-hmm. There's three or four things that don't explain quickly. And, um, Right, and take a while, and literally, primary flow activity is where we start. Our we start there, right? We start with really simple stuff. Start there. Are you sleeping seven to eight hours a night? Right, is another place we start. You need, and it flows a high energy state, and you need energy for peak performance. And the data is overwhelming on sleep. So sweet, you know, I'm like, I as I said, not super sexy, deadly effective, right? So. Um, those are just a couple of easy places for people to start. Um, yeah, gotcha. Um, so segueing into, into a different topic, but also trying to, trying to keep it relatable to, to flow and, 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 you know, kind of what what the impacts of our, our, our brain could be around this for future technologies. Are you excited about new technologies like Neuralink? that could essentially help people get into flow faster? Is there certain things around innovative technologies that are coming out that could help people almost reverse engineer flow and allow them to have that on a more consistent basis? Um, yes, but Neuralink is not one of them. Okay. Um, uh, I, uh, I'm not... Uh, the, their work is interesting. Um, I think it is massively overblown from where the actual research and the research they made. The research is astounding, right? But I, it doesn't match with the whole rest of the field. So either hmm. something is very wonky, um, and they got somehow got years and years and years and years and years ahead of everybody. The pronouncements are a little monkey i love all that work i think it's super cool i wrote about a lot of it in futures faster than you think in the previous book to the, the new one um but here's the big deal this is what we're doing also we're we're at work on this so maybe i'm a little biased but flow states have triggers we know video games are pretty good at them at getting at them but vr and ar are really deadly effective at getting at flows triggers. Mm -hmm. so what we've been doing is we're looking at a combination of flow science virtual and augmented reality and AI. And what we're interested in doing is building a high flow, accelerated learning environment. The AI bit allows us to make it individually customizable, right? So I can customize it to your learning needs, self-directed, individually customizable learning works better kind of thing. So AI allows us to make it individually customizable, self-directed. Um, VR means fully distributed, right? You don't need classrooms with me anywhere. And a, a flow science allows us to make it a high flow learning environment. We're doing it for uh, worker retraining is our for our initial focus because um, whether or not, I, you know, we've done a lot of work on, I don't think the level of technological unemployment people are scared of is coming at all. I think that's that's a nonsensical idea because there are about 12 to 15 different technologies now on exponential growth curves. And whenever a technology goes exponential, there's an internet sized opportunity tucked inside. Mm-hmm. And we didn't see the internet coming until it was here. And suddenly we were like, oh my God, look at this. And you know, people say, oh, the internet took jobs. It created three to four jobs for every one job it took. So net positive on jobs for sure. That seems to be what's coming. So I'm not, unless, but, we know, for example, um, autonomous trucks are coming. Trucking is the largest employer in America, which means that the largest employer in America, those workers are over the next 10 to 15 years. It takes a while, right? Trucks are very, very expensive. This is not gonna happen overnight. There's a long time for this change to happen, and a lot of other changes will come along the way. But those people are gonna need to be reskilled. and creating a high flow learning environment where people are learning 240 to 500% faster than normal is exciting and a cool way of doing it. And of course, the same kind of platform can be used for education. I don't want to use it for education because I don't want to get into a curriculum battle with parents 
over right. what we should be teaching their kids. That's right. somebody else's fight. But I am interested in creating the platform that will facilitate this. Um, so, and I'm not saying some of the neural link brain enhancement stuff isn't going to get us there. Um, also, I just, I think that stuff is much farther away um, than stuff that would, like is already here and is going to be coming online over the next few years. And, you know, we're, we're there right now. We're using a subjective psychological questionnaire to measure flow. That's industry standard. And it's awesome, extremely well validated and everything else. But we're trying to build a biophysical based flow detector. Um, and so are a bunch of other people, but yeah. we're doing this actively at the collective as well. Um, and, you know, something that looks at certain neurological and physiological signals and says, oh, you're in flow, you're not in flow. And if you're not in flow, do X, Y, and Z to get to flow, right? Like we're, we're not there yet, but I think we could be in the next three to five years. We'll start mm -hmm. seeing basic versions and it'll get better from there. And, um, and that's just based on, you know, tech that we can sort of see already right now. Um, and, you know, if like Mary Lou Jetson's blue water uh, her uh, portable fMRI machine, mm. you know, comes online in the next two. I mean, that changes everything, right? For sure. For now sure. suddenly you've got real time fMRI when people are walking around in the real. I mean, are you kidding? You know, so some of this, you know, other people are are working on things that will just vault the field ahead if it happens. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I hope that uh, the adoption of something like Neuralink is right around the corner, but it, it seems like. Just the idea of having something implanted into you, is but probably... you don't need. I mean, we don't need it. That's the, the most. The reason everybody wants it is: can we keep pace in AI? How do we? Right. The problem is we have local and linear brains in global and exponential worlds. Right. Yeah. That's the problem. And the real issue is we can process information at that speed and that scale. We have to be in flow to do it. That's what flow does. It massively amplifies all of the brain's information processing. Systems. We literally take in more information per second. We process it more quickly, process it more quick, completely, find deeper patterns, find more patterns, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Flow allows us to compete at speed and at scale, A. And B, all the best data shows that um, the most power comes from human AI, human AI collaboration, not from AI alone, the robots aren't coming for our jobs, the AI, because what the data overwhelming, BMW tried it, right? Tesla tried it. They automated their entire lines. They took all the humans out and productivity crashed. Mm. They had to put the humans back into the chain, working with the AI and the robots to maximize productivity. That's what's most effective. That's what the data says over and over and over again. And at least for the next 10 to 15 years, that's our world. And for that world, flow is all the application you need yeah definitely definitely and it's it's so much about creativity <laughs> and and less about being efficient hoping that automation can take care of a lot of the things that people don't want to do or that are risking their lives to do and we can focus on a little bit more on high leverageable creative tasks so that's that's the exciting part are there any other innovative technologies that on the cusp of coming that is really exciting you you know, there's there's VR and AR, of course. There is flying cars. Well, there's robotics. Yeah, flying I mean, flying cars are really <laughs> interesting. But no, I mean, so we wrote about the holodeck is coming from holodeck. Star Trek. Yeah, so like they're building um, some of the top guys in Hollywood. I mean, holograms are already here, and they can make holographic wall displays. We can use this is going to blow your mind. You can use ultrasound, the same technology you use for to look at fetuses to create texture. Sound waves have, you can use ultrasound to make objects feel, not like real objects, but like they feel like something. So Whoa. we're there, they think we're gonna start seeing the first Holotex in the early 2030s. That's pretty insane. Like the texture like, you mean, the feeling yeah, of it. The actual, like you're gonna be projected a holographic oh image God. of a microphone and you're gonna touch it and it's gonna, it's not gonna feel, Exactly like a microphone, you're gonna be able to put your fingers through it, right? But it's gonna be something, and couple that with some of the haptic sensory stuff that are coming, we're getting fully immersive alternate environments. That's really interesting as a creative, as a storyteller, mm -hmm. as a 
you know, all that whole side of me is like, whoa, what are we going to be able to do with that? And how much, you know, talk about a flowy environment and a flowy thing to play with and, you know, ways to, you know, uh, talk about a place I could run experiments. So like that kind of stuff is really, really super interesting to me. Um, there's a bunch more, but you, you got to sort of point me in a category because in the, you know, we invest, we looked at the 11 biggest industries on the planet and said, well, what's going to say the same in 10 years and what's going to change? Everything's different. Nothing's going to stay the same. Right. right? right. That, that, that's the, that's the whole point. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, and that's, I, that's also, I think the point about a lot of the peak performance stuff, and I think we're feeling this as, as people stuff that, 60s and the 70s and the 80s even in the 1990s was sort of optional is no longer here in the 21st century you know and definitely in the 2020s this human performance stuff it's not optional anymore it's yeah. sort of mandatory if you're going to keep pace with life in the 21st century and i um i don't know how much more time uh we have but i, I want to drop one more sort of interesting bomb that sort of came out of the work Please. that's in the new Art of yeah. Impossible because it's really so I can do it quickly or slowly but like Take a lot time. of the work that's inside of Art of Impossible is about for example harnessing you stacking for example intrinsic motivation and when we talk about intrinsic motivation you're talking about big five motivators autonomy passion purpose curiosity and mastery and flow big six motivators, right? So flow amplifies those other five, but I said you have to train up the very skills that are underneath it, that sort of thing. All of this stuff, all the 30 years of peak performance research has sort of led to a couple overarching conclusions. The first is that we are all sort of capable of so much more than we know. We are designed to go big. We're built to go big. And the research is really clear on this. Like flow is a massive amplification of performance. It's universal. Every human being can get into flow provided certain initial conditions are met, right? The flow triggers and you know what you're doing. We're wired to go big. We're wired to our rise to our full potential. The, the brilliant psychologist Abraham Maslow once said, whatever a human being can be, they must be. What we're now starting to figure out is how true that is. So here's the crazy part and here's the bombshell. We're built to go big. We're built to go so much farther than we think we are and not going big is bad for us. That's the most important thing that I can leave you with. And let me just give you a really simple example. So depression and anxiety are at epidemic levels, right? One out of 10 adults is going to suffer from depression or anxiety over the next year. Somebody kills themselves once every 12 seconds. The largest drain on our public health dollars our mental illnesses, depression, and anxiety. This is a global epidemic at a proportion like we've never seen. And it's interesting, there are eight major causes of depression and anxiety. Two of them get the most attention, genetics and trauma, right? Oh, my genetics are screwed up, I can't make enough serotonin, I'm depressed or I'm anxious. Or trauma, this horrible thing happened in my life and I just can't get past it. And those are the two things that get the most run. They're sensationalist. They get a lot of attention. And they're both not true. I mean, they're true, but they're big caveats. De uh, genetics alone, almost impossible for it to, on its own, produce depression or anxiety. It's genetics plus something going on in your life, always. Something that happened. So the, usually often something going on in your life. And with trauma, the vast majority of the time, trauma and exposure to trauma, whatever it is, leads to post-traumatic growth, right? This is Hemingway's idea. The world breaks everyone and many are stronger of the broken places, but it's many. As a general rule, bad shit in our lives leads us to grow. That's where it leads. It doesn't lead to oh, post-traumatic stress disorder. It leads to post-traumatic growth. Yes, my one of my dogs just yeah, walked by. One of the one of the twenty five or whatever. <laughs> one of the twenty five. The big guy whose job is to guard the the tiny ones. Yes. We have mostly small dogs. Um but uh if you look at the other six major causes of anxiety and depression, let me give you a simple one. This is really near the top, is lack of meaningful work. One of the major causes of anxiety and depression. What does that mean under the hood? Neurobiology. 
effort that is not aligned with my purpose. I don't have the autonomy, the freedom to pursue it in the way that I think I should do it. It doesn't offer the opportunity for mastery, right? It's not improving the, these great skills that I could use, and it doesn't produce flow. That's what we're actually talking about. Mm. System is built to go big, not going big is bad for us. And the other five kind of major causes of depression are sort of more of the same. Um, so I think that is sort of really, really new. But I think that's another reason why I sort of said a second ago, this is what led into this. I said, you know, things that were optional before are no longer optional. And I, you know, this is one of those things, right? Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we're, especially in 2021, coming out of the year we just had, and maybe the past, you know, it's been a hard five years, I would say, um, I think for most of us. And uh, I, I think, you know, stuff that used to be optional is no longer optional for yeah. really good, cool reasons. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I mean, I think, I think the, the deep root of the way to unlock these people's uh, ability to think big is probably going to require some unlearning in a lot of ways. Are there things that you work on with clients to help them unlearn some of the things that may have deceived them or that may not have served them in their lives that's actually blocking them from being able to go big and getting into flow and learning new things well, in their lives? So the flow blocker diagnostic that I, that I, that I gave you is, uh, that's an example of that. I mean, you're, the answer is yes, yeah. sort of all over the place. Um, another one is uh, uh, we talked about the primary flow activity, right? That requires a tremendous amount of unlearning about what is high performance, what is wasting your time, what is self-indulgence, what should you feel guilty about, right? Those are these are big shifts for people, and um, we always say with flow work. Uh, with this kind of stuff, like with primary flow activities, you have to make flow the center of your life. It's the most, getting into flow becomes the most important thing you do, but a lot of things get counter, sometimes get counterintuitive off of that. I'll give you another example at a, at a really, here's a really simple one, but it's weird. Uh, so, um, flow states have triggers and they also have cycles. So flow is not a binary, not in the zone or out of the zone. It's a four step process. It's a cycle and it starts out in a struggle phase. So in flow, the prefrontal cortex is turned off In struggle. It's totally turned on. It's on overload and struggle is literally uh, foundationally frustrating. There is uh, there is new work that we're helping do that says you may have to trigger the fight response to get into flow on the front end. And even if that's not the case, struggle is a loading phase. You're loading and overloading the brain with information and because our working memory, what you can think about at any one time is limited. Most people tap out after about four items. Just going through the struggle phase is literally frustrating by design. It will always feel frustrating. Now, you probably learned and most people think that frustration is a sign that you're doing something wrong. You're moving in the wrong direction. You're not getting it in flow work. It's actually a sign that you're moving in the right direction. You're exactly where you, it doesn't change the fact that it still feels awful. It biologically, you can't, you can learn to go, oh, this frustration is a sign I'm moving in the right direction. And like, you can know better. I know better. It doesn't change the fact that it's still freaking frustrating <laughs> for me and I hate it, right? Um, I certainly know better. There's, so it's less about unlearning and more about, hey, this thing that you thought meant this, it still does, but not in these situations, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a bunch of that or peak performers needing to learn that sometimes they need to push less hard to go farther, right? With the challenge skills sweet spot staying at around 4%, right? But um, those two things, like doubling down on your primary flow activity, you know, aiming for that 4% sort of sweet spot, these are massive levers in your life. They just, right, they just don't sound that way because they're not super sexy and they're not as whiz bang as microdosing with LSD might sound or something like that. Sure, sure. Awesome. Well, I think that was a great way to end off this great conversation, Stephen. I know the book is out 
now, The Art of Impossible. So I highly recommend people to check that out. It should be out now. And all of the other books that you've written, I mean, Abundance, Bold, which is great by Peter, uh, with you and Peter Diamandis, Stealing Fire, The Rise of the Superhuman. I uh, would highly recommend you guys to check out the things that uh, Stephen mentioned. I think flowblocker.com is one of them. Zero to... Uh, dangerous. Dangerous. Dangerous.com will give you our, a, a flow training or if you want to just sign up for an informational interview. And people learn a lot in those interviews. Uh, and theartofimpossible.com is the book. Yep. Um, Definitely check that out. And where can people find you online if they want to follow you? StephenCotler.com. StephenCotler.com. Beautiful. Or the Flow Research Collective.com. <laughs> a lot of links. I'll try to link all those things links. down. There's yeah. a lot of them. Sorry about that. Yeah, and no by worries. Way, just just because we started here and we spent so much time here, if the work with animals is intriguing, my book, uh, Small Furry Prayer, mm. covers that work. It's Definitely. mostly about the relationship between humans and animals, but we, it, it talks a lot about the, the sanctuary work we did. If anybody's curious, Everything you've never wanted to know and everything you, that could possibly go wrong and human beings could do wrong. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> it's one of those stories. Yeah, yeah. We, we didn't even get into the, you know, the book around, like, you, I know you wrote a lot about, like, animals on drugs and uh, it, there's a lot of these things that I want to talk to you about. So we'll definitely have to have a round two. Steven, thank you so much for making the time. Thank you guys for listening and uh, we'll see you guys next week. <laughs>